uh, a very good afternoon to everyone i dr vaidya hibbert third year resident of oral and maxillofacial surgery uh, is the, your host for today's event i would like to uh, i would like to start off by extending our sincere gratitude to each and every one for accepting our invitation to the webinar application of artificial intelligence and mechanical uh, machine learning in dentistry organized by oral and maxillofacial surgery and pdch visnagar i welcome all the dignitaries present over here for taking time from their busy schedules it is basically said that there is no limit to what we as a women can accomplish and this really stands true for the professor dr vilas patel ma'am ma'am it is giving me an immense pleasure and pride to welcome you for this event today i would also Thank like you, i would also like uh, to welcome the constant pillar of the organizing committee professor dr anil managutti sir head of the department of oral and maxillofacial surgery department now i request professor dr sailesh manath sir to brief us about the uh, webinar and to introduce the eminent speaker with the audience over to you sir Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Dr. Telesh Menon, in Department of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery, and PCH. Once again, welcome. I am from this institute since 15 years. This institute was the 2006 with the objective to provide education that will help to develop children. into balanced personalities with sound values of love kindness devotion and approach of service before self the institute has bds intake of 100 students and this is the only college of north gujarat to run mds program in all nine branches of dentistry the core mission of our university is to educate new generation with innovative thinking university provides critical fundings for talented students and faculties for fundamental research enable students and faculties to exchange ideas and help students to prepare them to be citizen of rapidly changing world in view of this we have organized this webinar on artificial intelligence and machine learning with the objective to enrich faculty scholars and researchers about application of artificial intelligence and machine learning and to focus on latest development in artificial intelligence the participants will be benefited by getting awareness applications and research opportunities in the field of artificial intelligence and machine learning now source of today's webinar professor dr fox pendick he is the chair and head department of oral and diagnostic digital health and health service research <laughs> director medical center for dental and orofacial services he is specialist in restorative and preventive dentistry berlin germany so uh, i hand over to dr fox pendick for the webinar thank you i hope you can hear me clearly and i think you can also see me yes if sir not, yes. wonderful thank you um if not you can still say something but i think it's fine i will just share my screen with you if that's okay yes sir 
And then let's go. It will probably take some seconds until it starts. And I think I need to go back into the starting slide there as well. Just a second. I think you are now seeing the wrong screen, but that's something we can solve. So now you should see the big screen and my little face at this point in time. Wonderful. I'm first of all very happy that you invited me here. It's an honor and it's obviously quite an large group. I'm surprised. So over 60 people, that's that's very good. And I'm happy that that topic of AI for dentistry came up here. I'm also very happy that DMG, a material manufacturer from Hamburg here in Germany is supporting that lecture. DMG is manufacturing a range of materials, restorative materials, impression materials, like uh, also, for example, temporary materials. And they are manufacturing one of the materials I will talk about today, the icon concept, the infiltration material, which I will present at the end of my lecture. My lecture is basically a summary for one example of where you could use AI with a focus on carriers detection, carriers management. So what I want to show you is how AI in your clinic, in your university, in your practice could be used to facilitate diagnostics, patient communication, treatment planning, and even treatment if you then have a modern treatment concept, a modern therapy. And as I said, to disclaim, this lecture was supported by DMG. And I also want to disclaim that I will show you a software system later on. It's called Dental X-Ray Pro. It's an AI-based system, which we developed here in Berlin, Germany, and which we are actively selling. We also want to go to India very soon there. And um, I'm a co-founder of the company selling that software, so I'm not without any biases. But if you have questions, I think I'm also well suited to answer them. Let me also acknowledge the organizers of this symposium here, as well as the team around your university and a special thanks to Dr. Managuti who invited me, but also um, the other people here on that slide, which I'm very happy that that happened. Let me start with, with my agenda. What kind of points do I have for the next round about 90 minutes? But first of all, I will discuss with you the difficulties in diagnosing carriers. But as I said, it's only one example. We could also discuss the difficulties in diagnosing periodontal bone loss or the difficulties in diagnosing cysts and tumors of the bone and extra oral tissues and so on. So we, it's just one example to then show you in the second part of the lecture that AI can help us. It can help us in this case here with carrier detection, but also other things. And in that part of the lecture, I will also present to you how AI works what kind of mechanisms are behind not only dental and medical, but also general AI. And then in the second, uh, the third part, I will explain to you how the early detection of things can then facilitate early management, which on the other hand also means that if you do detect stuff early, you need an appropriate modern therapy option, which as I said, in this case for carriers could be the carriers infiltration, the icon concept, whilst for perio or surgery, it will be other, other aspects and other things. So let me start with proximal caries diagnostics. What's to know there? And I don't want to go into too much detail because I know this is not particularly fancy, but the first thing we need to acknowledge is that caries and many other of our dental diseases, also periodontal disease, for example, are not an on-off thing. They are not yes or no. They are staged in a wide range of stages and they have different activity levels in periodontology. We call them grades by now. So it's a complex, disease dental carriers with a wide range of activity and processes where we can interact. And one thing we have learned over the last 30 years is that of course it's possible to deal with carriers non-restoratively. The traditional approach of managing dental carriers by placing restoration was something which we did for nearly hundred years and we still need to do it for lesions where the cavity surface has been breached, where there's really a cavitation. From that point on, we usually can't deal with the lesion in any way different than drilling, opening it up and filling it with a restorative material, which is okay. That's what we do. We are dentists, we like to do this. But for earlier lesions, for these white spot lesions, you can see on the left-hand side, we are able to control the activity of the disease. We are able to arrest the carious lesion. And that is important to 
node because on the other hand, that means we need to find these early carrier solutions. If we don't find them, if we wait until they have progressed to the stages on the right hand side, it's too late. And then we can't do anything else. So we want to do early diagnostics for early management. And that is also something which we came up with, and I hope you can see that flowchart here now, which we came up with in a recent international consensus conference of the ORCA, the European and Global Organization of Carriers Research, as well as the European Federation of um, Conservative Dentistry, together with a number of national uh, organizations. And that kind of flowchart here, you don't need to, to look at it in too much detail. It's not too difficult, by the way. It just looks difficult because these flowcharts are always difficult to, to follow. What it says is, hey, if it's cavitated, you lost the game. You need to do invasive stuff. You're on the right-hand side of the flowchart. Flow if it's clinically certainly not cavitated, fine, go on, do normal microinvasive interventions, something I will talk about later. But then in between, we have a range of unclear situations where we need to use the depth of the lesion on, for example, the radiograph, and you can see these six sections here, to somehow guess, because we can't see it with the eyes, to guess if it's cavitated or not. And for enamel lesions and also the very early dental lesions, we are usually guessing, okay, they may not be cavitated. We may still do non or microinvasive early interventions and not take the drill, whilst as soon as they are deeper into dentin, we usually tend to go invasively. And I think you know all this, and I also think you know all this here. How good are we now with our diagnostics in finding carriers? And if you look at this, for example, with our eyes, we are not very good, especially in the proximal area. Our sensitivity, so the number of lesions which are there and which we find, is very low. We miss around 75% of early carriers lesions in the proximal areas in closed dental arches. We can't see them with our eyes. So we have a big problem with under detection. And that's why very regularly we are taking radiographs. And we are urging people to do this, at least here in Germany, every one and a half to two years for younger individuals, because these radiographs enable us to see also earlier caries lesions. And they also enable us, if you took them rightly, to somehow, as you can see here digitally, lay them over each other and see if there was progression or not. So a number of things could be done with, as you can see, a sensitivity which is rather in the 40% roughly which still means we are missing around 50 to 60 <coughs> for very early carries lesions, possibly even 70% of these lesions. So yes, we are better with regards to under and over detection, but we still miss a lot of things. And this is also something which, and from here on, I will then derive why we need AI, which a number of studies have confirmed, not only for carriers, but also for other dental diseases. We are just not very good in seeing things on images. And that is what you see here, a uh, recent Cochrane review. Most of you will hopefully know the Cochrane collaboration, which collects studies from all over the world. In this case, it was studies where they looked at radiographs, bite wings to detect early carriers lesions. And what they did here, they included over 100 studies. Each of these symbols in that funny plot here is a study. And what they did is they plotted these studies according to their sensitivity on the y-axis. So you wanna be as high as possible to have a high sensitivity and the specificity, which is basically your false positive rate on the x-axis. So you, what you wanna have is you wanna be on the upper left corner, just for those of you who don't know these plots very well, on the upper left corner of this plot. If you're on the upper left, you're really, really good. And you can see that some studies showed, hey, dentists are very good in finding carries on bite wings. They have a sensitivity and a specificity of around 90%. But what we can also see is that they're are studies which are far worse than that. There are studies which show that dentists are really, really bad at looking at bite wings. They have a sensitivity of 40, 30, 20, 10%, and sometimes also specificities which are way below 50%. So basically these studies, if you would believe them, they tell you don't take bite wings because we dentists, we are not able to interpret them, which of course is nonsense. That's a little bit of a methodological problem which we have with a lot of these studies. And that's why statistically you pool these studies and you can see these red and black dots with the ellipses around them. We pool these studies to somehow reflect on the likely true value. And the likely true value is exactly where I mentioned it before. Dentists have a good specificity. Our false positive rate is not very high on 
fibrings for carrier detection, but our sensitivity is not great. It's around 40 to 50%. We are missing more than 50% of the carrier lesions, especially early carrier lesions. You're probably missing even more. And it doesn't matter if it's in the primary or the permanent dentition. That's the left plot where the primary dentition are the black circles and the permanent dentition, the red symbols, or if it's proximal or occlusal at the uh, right spot, we are not very good at doing this, regardless of the dentition and the lesion type. And that's exactly where we need possibly AI. At least this was something we came up with about four years ago when we thought, well, others can do it. Why can't we do it? It could be helpful diagnostically. And I will explain to you later that it could be helpful in a number of ways beyond diagnostics. What is meant with AI? Well, the term is not new. It has changed in its definition over the last 70 years, but it has been around for quite a while since the early 50s. And it's basically everything where human cognition is needed. And then a machine does it. So talking, interacting, somehow writing, speaking, assessing images, and so on. That is something which we would call AI as long as a machine is conducting these cognitive human tasks. And you can see that there are a large range of fears. So uh, Dr. Mananguti is, for example, an oral surgeon, and he asked me to maybe talk about oral surgery just before that lecture. Um, I'm not an oral surgeon, so I'm not an expert on this. But what we are seeing is increasingly in this field of oral surgery, surgery robots. Surgery robots which can assess the clinical situation using a certain image analytic AI. And then they can derive the needed action autonomously to, for example, insert an implant. And that has been done in a number of studies that fully autonomously these robots do surgery. And of course, that's not the standard in dentistry and also not in oral surgery. And you need to ask why should it do it autonomously? There's no need to do it autonomously. So I don't think we will see that in the future too much. It's more of a prototype and idea finding. But what it shows us is that these systems are already there. They are already in the practice. And of course, in many bigger surgeries like MaxFest surgeries or abdominal surgeries, surgery robots are already assisting us massively. But also simulations, for example, are a field where AI is in. Pharmaco development. None of the big pharma companies is developing drugs like they did 50 years ago. All of them are using computers to simulate drug interactions and drug target interactions before they go into the lab and do some wet lab stuff there. Expert systems like dashboards, like business information systems and so on. These are also, also in many cases AI driven. Computer language is a field which is highly prolific. Probably the most dynamic field we're having in AI at the moment is computer language like Siri and all these assistant systems. That is not yet there for medicine and dentistry, but in five years, maybe you invite me again and maybe I can explain you more about computer language in dentistry because the potential is there. Computers can understand unstructured language by now better than they ever could do it. And it's quite impressive. And also neural networks, which is something I wanna talk about today, specific AI for image analysis that has been developed over the last 10 years and it's routinely working as I will explain in a minute. All of these systems are building on one technology in many cases, and that's machine learning. And especially for computer language and neural networks, they build on a very complex type of machine learning, which we call deep learning. And I will come to this in a sec. What is machine learning? How does it work? You all know normal software. You're all using normal software like Microsoft Excel. Someone sits in there on their computer and is writing program with rules. And when you provide data, like a column of numbers, you get out an answer. For example, if you use the sum function, you get out a sum. That is okay, but of course it needs someone who's programming it. And that means that that task of programming is done by a human and of obviously limited to a certain number of programmed rows, lines, maybe some thousands, maybe some, some 10 thousands. To understand an image, that might not be enough. If I would tell you in the next image how you explain to a computer that this is a car or this is a cat or this is a mouse, and how you, for example, discriminate a cat from a mouse, you would need to explain quite a lot. Is it the fur? Is it the ears? What is it, the mustache? Well, it's, it's not. The cat looks, when you only explain these three features, exactly the same as a mouse. 
So you need to go into far more detail and that is getting tricky and difficult. And at some point for complex material like images, like language, we are reaching limits of what humans can program. And that's why for about 10, 15 years, the technology of machine learning and specifically deep learning has really taken off. The idea is that the machines themselves are writing these rules. Nobody is programming them any longer. The machine is programming itself. How is it doing this? Well, what we are doing is we are providing a bunch of data, like for example, images, photos. And we are telling the machine up front for each photo, on this photo, there's a car, on this photo, there's a butterfly, on this photo, there's a cat or a mouse. And what the machine then is doing, it's randomly initiating an algorithm with a very, very, very high number of parameters. I will come to this in a second. And it's starting to guess, it's saying, well, I guess it's a butterfly, like in the sketch on the right hand side. And then you say, no, no, no. I told you here with this label, this data point, this image has a label, it's a car. Do it again. And then the machine says, okay, I was wrong, bad. I will try to adjust my algorithm a little bit here and there. And hopefully at this point it gets better. And then it says, oh, I'm better now. I can keep that and start to manipulate the algorithm in other areas. So over several thousand of runs, it's improving this algorithm stepwise on very large data. It looks at thousands of images and does this repeatedly. It improves the algorithm to at the end, being able to describe to itself how a car looks and to discriminate it from a butterfly. And hopefully, if it has been done rightly, then also understand how a butterfly and a car looks on new unseen imagery. To do this, however, the machine first needs to understand what's on the image. If it needs to run an algorithm to understand on this image, it's a cat, but it could also be a dog. And as you can see here, it's from Stanford programming course. The image classifier even says, well, it could also be a hat or a mug. You would think, why does it guess that? It's clearly a cat, isn't it? You all see this within a second, it's a cat. But for the machine, it isn't. For the machine, it's only numbers. It's only pixel intensities. For a black and white image, like a radiograph, it's black and white. So one channel intensities. And for colored image, it's several color channels like red, blue, and green. And what it does with these pixel intensities is it runs over these images with the pixels, a filter. A filter, for example, for corners. And whenever it hits a corner, it beeps, you get a signal. And whenever it hits with the next filter, maybe a line or a circle or a certain color or a certain texture, or maybe very complex patterns, it always beeps. So it runs thousands of different filters over that image to understand how this image looks, that it has maybe certain lines here, that it has gray in the middle and other colors on the other hand, that there are some round structures in the face. So it abstracts the image into numbers. And then it runs, as I said in the slide before, these machine learning algorithms over it and tries to understand and reflect these numbers. And they are getting very, very good. They are very, very good these days. And you know this, in every traffic camera, in every security camera at an airport, in every of our phones, we have these systems and they are able to understand that this is a person and this is a horse and this is a cat and this is a dog. And they can even do more complex tasks like you can see on the right-hand side where they are segmenting this image. They're not only saying, well, it's there, but they are segmenting it. They, are, they even know that these pixels belong to different sheeps or on the right-hand side, and that is getting quite complex. On the lower right-hand side, you have an image where there's cutlery and glasses and chairs on this image and everything is a bit overlapping. This is difficult and nevertheless, they are getting there and they are really, really good by now. But of course, some problems are harder than others. And that is an example, which I always like to bring because it's funny, I hope so, at least I liked it when I saw it first. And especially the chicken wings or that, I think it's a quadruple or whatever the name of the dog is. It's really hard because they are fairly similar. Okay, so got the other dog on the right hand side with the towel is also not easy, but on the left hand side, I find this very challenging. And of course, our field medicine and dentistry is also not easy. It's also quite hard. Why is that? Why is dentistry, why is medicine hard? Well, first of all, think about how Facebook, how Google, 
how Tesla, how are they learning to understand what is a cat, what is a dog, what's a traffic camera, and what is a stop sign? Well, first of all, they built on a large data set which Google has established about 15 years ago, and it's growing. It's called ImageNet, and there are over 1.2 billion images in there. We don't have that kind of data set in dentistry, in medicine, because data protection reasons usually don't permit to pool so many images. Most studies in the field of dental AI use some hundreds or some thousands of images, three, four thousand, which is okay. We nevertheless get quite good with it. But if you used one million images, you probably would be very, very good. But we are not there yet. So that's one thing. The second thing is, how does Google or Facebook or Tesla, how do they learn on these images? Who's telling them that in this area of that image, there's a traffic light or a stop sign? Well, we are. Whenever you are asked, for example, by Google, hey, are you really a human? Please, in this image with the four by four tiles here, please tell me where there's a traffic sign or a motorbike or a car. So we are labeling, as we call it, these images for them. And that's incredibly smart and very cheap because we don't cost them anything. Again, this is something we can't do in medicine. You need a medical expert and even the experts are not always agreeing. So you usually need several experts looking at one single image and medical experts are expensive. So we have a number of difficulties in our field, which explains why we are around five years behind others and maybe even 10 years behind normal photo analytics by Facebook or Google. But nevertheless, we are getting there. And this is something which we started about three years ago. We started with radiographic analysis. Give me a radiograph and I try to analyze what's on it using machines. And the first thing you could of course do is, well, I count and classify teeth like you see in the upper example. And now you would think, well, this is an A, it's boring, B, who needs it? And three, it needs to be very easy. It seems easy, every dentist can count teeth. Well, none of it is true. It's not easy. It's not, well, you think it's boring, but it's not that boring, at least for me. And the third thing is, it's not easy. It was very surprising for us to see that classifying teeth and learning the machine that this is not tooth number one six, but tooth number one seven. So the upper left six and the upper left seven or upper right six, upper right seven, or lower left six and lower left seven, to discriminate these teeth from each other is very, very difficult because they look similar. So you need to understand a little bit of the specifics of how to train these systems. And that, that's a very dentally specific problem to really get high accuracies. And the second thing is, even if you have a system, you can see this there, which, which has an accuracy of 98% or something, well, that still means that if it's a tooth level accuracy, you make mistakes on every 50 tooth, which means on every second image. Well, that's clinically not enough. You don't want to correct the machine on every second image. You, you probably will accept if it happens on every 10th or 20th or 50th image, but not on every second image. So you need very high accuracies. And the same is true for the bottom example, which we developed about two years ago, a model to detect and classify restorations. Also a task which isn't that easy, but by now it's there. And why do you need these models? Well, you need them, especially the first one, because you want to, at the end, for a full-fledged software system, like the one I will explain in a second, you need to generate a report at the end. Each of us, if we do an analytics of an image, want to generate a report. And ideally, I don't want to type it down with my fingers. I want the machine to do this automatically within two seconds to relieve me from that boring task. And to do this, we need to know, oh, that carious lesions belongs to this tooth, or that apical lesions belongs to this tooth, or that crown belongs to this tooth. And then now we are there. And there are a number of systems out there worldwide. A number of them are from America. There's also one from Russia. And of course, there's that one I will present to you today. It's called Denti X-Ray Pro. And this is the last version. We just released a new version some weeks ago. It's in usage in Europe by several hundred practices and several thousand dentists. And it's probably at the moment the most developed system in the world when it comes to functionality and how it works. We can detect carious lesions on panoramics and on bite wings. We can detect apical lesions on the panoramics. We will soon be able to detect periodontal bone loss in a very nice fashion um, on panoramics. And of course, there are a number of machine learning models in the background, as you can see there, which allow 
the machine to detect teeth and classify them as well as to detect crowns, fillings, root canal treatment implants, and to assign them to teeth. And that allows you to interact then with the system to generate a report and so on. But coming back to my question or to my problem of carriers as one example where AI could help us. How good is AI for carriers detection? Because what we stated about 10 minutes ago was, oh, we dentists, we have a problem. We are not particularly good at diagnosing carriers, especially early carriers on bite wings. And of course, we also developed the machine learning algorithms for this, and it's enabled there. And I must say that this is probably the model which is at the moment, the most advanced, the best of our models. And since that study, which I'm showing here, which is one and a half years old study, we published it very nicely in the Journal of Dentistry. Since that study, it has evolved, but even at that time when we published the study, we showed a number of things. And by now, you know these plots already, so I don't need to explain them. I just remind you, specificity on the x-axis, sensitivity on the y-axis, you wanna be in the upper left corner. And what you can see here is the model, as the black line and the optimized cutoff where we froze the model. So the model we used essentially was the blue dot there. And we compared the model against seven independent dentists who are indicated by the pink quadrangles here. And the first thing we need to state, none of the dentists was better than the model. And the second thing we need to state is the dentists were especially poor in many instances when it comes to their sensitivity. The model was, as you can see there, not much better with regards to specificity, but with regards to sensitivity. And we discriminated this once more, comparing the sensitivity in this bar plot for initial lesions in yellow and advanced lesions in red. And we compared the model against the seven dentists D1 to D7. And it's very fascinating to see that the dentist, and that's what you would expect, they were not too bad when it comes to advanced, deeper dental lesions. They, this is something we, we can see because the patterns are more clearly visible to us. For the early lesions, the minute enamel changes, only one dentist was okay, good, similarly good as the model, whilst the other six dentists were really, really poor. Exactly in the range which I explained before, we miss around 70, 75% of early carious lesions, I said 15 minutes ago. The model, however, didn't care. For the model, it wasn't more difficult to detect enamel initial lesions than deeper dentin lesions. Because it doesn't look the way we look, it uses, you learned that by now, filters, it runs filters over the image. And obviously, the morphologies and the specific items, the features as we call it, which it uses to detect advanced lesions are also applicable to enamel lesions. And that is fascinating. And that is a pattern which we are seeing for other AI applications as well. These AI applications, depending on how they're trained, they can boost our sensitivity. And then we still, as humans, we still have our human inherent specificity. So if the model is a bit more on the side, we detect a lot of things, but we may be wrong. In some cases, we may generate false positives. Ideally, we as dentists, we can still combine that with our high specificity and then double check these areas, these suspicious areas, and refute the model in some cases. And this is something which we also somehow programmed into the software I showed you. So let's, let's give you an example. This is a bite wing. And now you are already very focused because I told you five times that we dentists are not very good in finding carriers on radiographs. And if I give you a lot of time now, let's say three, four minutes, I'm sure the vast majority of you would find nearly all of these lesions. However, if I hadn't primed you that way, and if I would give you only 20 seconds, 30 seconds, like in clinical care and routine wise, your waiting room is busy and a lot of people are out there waiting for you, you probably would miss a lot of these lesions. The AI takes around five seconds for this five seconds to detect all of these lesions, to show you these lesions as pixel overlays, to generate that tooth map on the bottom there, which allows you to communicate with your patients very nicely now. 
And that is something which I find fascinating and something which we didn't plan up in, in, uh, in advance. If you switch that off, and of course that system here is a number of filtering systems, so you can switch off and on the, um, the different icons here and, and the pixel overlays. If you do this two or three times, if you say to your patient, well, please look at this area here at the occlusal lesion on the lower right six, and you go back and you go forth and you go back and you go forth. At some point, even the lay person, even your patient sees these pixel changes. And that for, for me, it was very fascinating to see this when our data scientists, so people from the tech community who are building that software, when they started to see it because they said, oh, I switched it on and off. Wow, I can see it. I can finally understand what my dentist is explaining to me. That is something which is massively powerful in dental practice because it brings the patient into a completely different zone. The patient finally believes us, he sees things. This is like a second opinion from an independent university, in this case from Berlin, Germany. So it's like trust increasing as well. And we did a study just very recently, which we just submitted, which shows exactly this. These kind of AI systems, they do not only boost accuracy, they help us with communication and with trust. And what we did, we of course improved that system and we are currently improving it even further. We developed something which dentists in the field asked us to do, which we call the so-called Carriers Pro mode. And you can see this there on the bottom. We now have in this system also deep learning models which can detect the depth of the lesion, which is massively helpful. Remember what I said earlier, deeper dental lesions need restorative care, earlier enamel and very, very early dental lesions need non-invasive care. So knowing what kind of depth your system has, uh, your carrier has, is helpful, it supports treatment decision. And what it also does, as you can see, it does now tell you, oh, the lesion is exactly on the mesial surface, on the distal surface and so on. So it generates a very detailed report, which you then can, within one second, save as a PDF or interactively in your patient management system. And as I said, thousands of dentists are using it here in Germany and hopefully at some point, these kind of systems will be available as medical products in your country as well. I think this is important. This is a medical product, it's regulated. And regulation in India is, is okay, we, we checked it, but bringing it to, for example, the US or bringing it also to Europe is sometimes an administrative nightmare, but people need to go that route. And I know that there are a number of companies out there who will try to circumvent this a little bit and just selling their product. But be careful if you're using products also in India, you have medical regulation. If you're using products which are not regulated properly, you are legally in a problem. And that's why at the moment we are only selling it in Europe because we are only regulated and certified for Europe. So coming back to the beginning of my lecture, I told you diagnosing and managing carriers early is our aim, is our goal. And the question now is why is that? Why would we do this? Why in this patient here, for these early lesions, please don't look at the other ones. That patient has a lot of lesions. Why would you do that? Why would we like to diagnose caries early? And why don't we always drill? I mean, this is what we do. We're dentists. We're used to do it and we're good at it. Well, the reason for this is this. And some of you may know that. Whenever you initiate a restorative therapy for an initial caries lesion and place a filling there, you're starting something which we call the death spiral of the tooth. And it sounds a bit scary, I suppose it should sound scary. Because our fillings, our restorations have a finite lifetime. And that seems hard to accept for many of us because we usually think that at least our own restorations are, they're perfect, but well, they aren't. And if we are looking into very, very controlled environments like in clinical study, we are looking at survival rates of survival times, maybe 15 to 20 years, which is long, it's very long. If we're looking into routine data, into claims data, for example, from let's say the German insurances, but also US insurances, or for example, in the NHS in the UK, it's not 15 years, it's seven to eight years roughly. The average filling in the UK or in Germany needs to be replaced after six, seven, eight years, maybe 10 years, depending how big it is. And that means that in the next step, that filling will be bigger, always. You can't avoid this because A, the filling usually fails because of either fracture of some tooth structure or secondary carries. And B, if you remove the remaining parts of the filling and clean it up and excavate a little bit, 
you, of course, increase the cavity size automatically once more. So the next filling will be bigger. And also that filling may fail after 10, 50 years. So then you still can do, let's say a partial crown. And you do that. And with the partial crown, you're running the risk of let's say pulp exposure or endodontic complications afterwards. And then you do your endo and for the vast majority of endodontics, you will be successful, but maybe for five to 10%, after some years, you will get complications because it was an upper left molar and you missed the second mesial buccal canal. You didn't find it. And you need to send that patient off to either a specialist or to a surgery department for an apicectomy. And at some point in that spiral, and it takes decades, which is great. I mean, this is, this is dentistry. That's exactly what we do for our patients. But at some point at that spiral, we are running out of options. And that's not so much a problem for a 70 year old patient, because you have, as you can see there probably overall, if you, if you don't omit and skip any of these steps there, you probably have 40, 45 years. But it's a problem for a patient who's initially 20, because these people now live longer than 65 years. They live under their 80, 85 in many circumstances. So our promise to our patients, we try to keep your teeth for life, is in danger if we initiate a restorative treatment for very early carious lesions. And that's exactly the reason why these days in cariology, but also in periodontology and many other aspects of dentistry, we are trying to go for non-invasive treatments. We are trying to be minimal invasive. And the question now is how good are we with this? And let's look into the study. It's a study from the 80s, which was published in the 90s. They followed up adolescent people. You can see this there in the title, aged 11 to 20 years old, over roughly 10 to 15 years. And they provided non-invasive treatment to their teeth, usually fluoride varnishes, fluoride geos, a lot of fluoride. If you ask a cariologist like myself, and I've been in cariology for, for a long time before I moved into the field of AI. If you ask a cariologist, what's your solution to a problem? He always says fluoride. So fluoride is our solution. And as you can see there, fluoride is very helpful to prevent carriers from developing. The time until a sound surface becomes carriers is long. Don't look at the, the times there. These are median progression times. They're hard to interpret. I wouldn't over... I wouldn't overtrust these numbers, forget the numbers. But what I want to tell you is we are very good with these non-invasive approaches with fluoride and flossing and everything in preventing caries. But once we have a caries lesion, once it is already in the enamel, it speeds up. And that study, as I said, they, they did everything. It's a study from Sweden. They were very, very conservative, very, very eager to prevent and arrest lesions. And nevertheless, they showed, oh, well, as soon as it's in the enamel, it starts to get a little bit faster. And as soon as it starts to touch the enamel dentin junction, it even paces up more. And even our fluoride is not able to arrest these lesions any longer. So if we, what's happening here now? If we come back to the options we are now having, for these early caries lesions, which you detected very nicely with your AI system in your practice now. We have to state that these are two basic options. We can either manage the symptoms, the disease symptoms, this, the lesion by drilling it out. That doesn't solve the caries itself because the process, the imbalance and the biofilm activity, the imbalance between re and demineralization, that's all there. You haven't solved that, you only, drilled out the hole and filled it. But okay, that's something we can do. Or we can do the other stuff, the non-invasive care, controlling the different aspects involved in carious development, like controlling minerals, fluoride, casein, phosphopeptide, and amorphous calcium phosphate, CPP, ACP, or other mineral deliverance. You can control the biofilm by oral hygiene, by flossing, by interdental brushing, by antimicrobials, by probiotics, I don't know what. Or you can try to go for sugar restriction by, for example, sugar replacement using xylitol or dietary control or whatever. But the bottom line is drilling initiates the restorative spiral and the non-invasive stuff is only limitedly effective to arrest carious lesions. It's okay and good 
to prevent them, but it's not very good at arresting Kyber's lesions. And that's why, and this is just one example of showing you how early detection using AI can then be used and funneled into early modern therapy, because it would be crazy. You have a, a smart AI system, you detect uh, all these early lesions, and then you take your drill like people did 100 years ago and you drill holes. That, that would be crazy because it, counter, it contradicts the idea of being smart in the diagnostics and then being not very smart in the therapy. And that's why to allow us to be smart in the therapy as well, people have developed in the 60s already alternative concepts for managing carious lesions. And they started with managing pit and fissure lesions by sealing them. Installing what we call today a diffusion barrier to prevent acids from going in and minerals going out allows to arrest that lesion indicated by the red dots here. That lesion, it's not here, it doesn't go away, but it stays like this because you can't demineralize it first, you can't lose minerals any longer. And that has been proven by around 25, 30 studies by now. So it's really, really something which works for early carious lesions. And that's why in the 90s, people started to think, well, if we can do this for pit and fissure lesions, we can probably do it for other lesions as well, can't we? Like proximal smooth surface lesions. And they started to do that as well. And they showed it works. I will come to this later. But what we also saw in these studies and in these approaches, uh, it's quite a mess. It's quite a mess. You need to protect the adjacent tooth from any kind of etchant and resin. You need to rely only on the micro-retention of the resin to that smooth surface because you don't have any kind of fissure and macro-retentive aspects. So you lose the sealant occasionally. And to bring the sealant into the interproximal area, you need a very fluid material, which however, you don't want to be everywhere. You only want it in that local area. So it's messy. And I know that some advocates are even saying they do this for cavitated proximal carious lesions with a flow of material. Okay, you can do this, but it's not easy. It's technically not very easy. I personally, I do that very often, sealing proximal surfaces when I operate on the adjacent tooth. When I, for example, remove a filling on the upper left five distally, and I see that there's an early carious lesion on the upper left six measly, and I can access it, then I do this because then it's easy. It's 30 seconds of etching. I place an adhesive there, like for example, a little bit filled adhesive, the Optibond FL adhesive, very locally. I cure it, I polish it, done. Takes one and a half minutes, perfect. But doing this in a closed center arch is tricky and relying on the retention is tricky. And that's why in the 2000s, an alternative was developed, the so-called carries infiltration, where we use a lowly filled resin to infiltrate the porous enamel of the carious lesion. We remove it from the surface. We don't want it at the surface. We light cure it. And basically the idea is exactly the same. It's a diffusion barrier against acid and mineral loss, but it's not on top of the tooth, it's within the tooth. It's otherwise exactly the same. And that infiltration concept, ICON, as I said, manufactured by DMG, who is sponsoring that session here, has been around for 10 years now, more than 10 years, and it has been tested in around 15 randomized controlled trials by now, roughly. Some of them are still running, the majority is concluded. And I just want to briefly show you how it works. This is a patient here, which clinically, you wouldn't see anything. You wouldn't see, why doesn't that work? Something is wrong here.
Now I'm back again, I think. My internet broke down in, in parallel to me looking for the slides, but that's not a problem, I'm back. So I found some slides which I wanted to show you. The idea behind the technology is as follows. And I will show you a very nice example in that video. Hopefully the video works. Um, the idea is that the porous enamel body, in this example, it's, it's sugar, sucks up using capillary forces that lowly filled resin. In this case, it's red, don't worry, clinically it's not red. And then you light cure it. And by protecting the crystals against the solvent, in this case, it's water, of course, for our teeth, it's acid, the solvent can't access the crystal any longer. And as you can see very nicely in that video here, the non-infiltrated cube, of course, it's dissolved. That's what sugar cubes do when we put them into water or hopefully it's coffee in many cases, whilst the infiltrated one isn't touched at all. And that's exactly happening with the teeth when you infiltrate them. And this is what I wanted to show you, the example. If I show you that image here now, what it should have been doing, but as I said, I needed to change slides now. That's why it's also in German. I wanted to show you, you detected the lesion with AI. If I ask you now, where's the lesion? I'll look around for a while. I can show you, it's here. You now use the AI to communicate it to your patient and you explain to him, I will do infiltration to these teeth. And what you can see it clinically, and that's what, something you saw already, it's not visible at all. So the first thing you do is you clean it, you do some moisture control, you apply rubber dam, then you separate the teeth with a separator. In this case, it's a plastic wedge which comes within the product in the package. You can also use a wooden wedge. And you need to do this with some force to somehow separate the teeth because in the next step, you want to apply, and that is one of the smartest aspects of the technology, this applicator here. And that applicator is really smart because the applicator is basically like a double foil, a transparent foil, where, for example, you push from the top your acid in to condition the surface. And as I said, you want to protect the adjacent tooth. You don't want to etch the adjacent tooth. So what this double foil has, it's only penetrated to one side. You can see that U-shaped penetrations there to the green side. We wanted to treat the lower right five, measly, if you remember the X-ray right. So the green side goes towards the lower right five. The white side, which is not penetrated, where nothing comes out, goes to the adjacent tooth. Then you place it with the U-shape directly below the contact point, and you, as a first step, etch with a specific etchant. And that needs some explanation. You're not using phosphoric acid here, you're using hydrochloric acid. Why? Because the hydrochloric acid allows us to open up the enamel body, the, the lesion body. Carious lesions, they are structured in multiple layers. The outermost layer is usually quite well mineralized because of the fluoride in our toothpaste and so on. But the huge part of the lesion, the so-called lesion body isn't. And that's where we wanna go with our infiltrant. So we need to etch away that surface layer for around two minutes with hydrochloric acid. It's green, it's not blue, just to indicate that it's a different acid. And that opens up the lesion for the infiltration. And after two minutes etching, you remove that applicator, you rinse it off, you dry it, and then you need to dry it once more with a little bit more technology. Why? because the lesion needs to be really, really dry. If it's not sufficiently dry, if the porous enamel body isn't really, really empty and void of any fluids, any water, it doesn't suck the resin in there. So what we are doing is we are using, the company is calling it, I can dry, it's basically ethanol. And any of you who ever cleaned windows with ethanol or acetone know, it evaporates massively quickly. So what we're doing, we are putting something in there which displaces the water and then evaporates very quickly and thereby dries the lesion like crazy. You do this for around 30 seconds and then you use the second syringe. As you can see there, it's black, it's light proof where the lowly filled resin is in, the so-called icon infiltrant. And you apply it with your headlights and your operating lights removed for three minutes. And in these three minutes, it's a bit boring for you because you just sit next to that and you let it happen. In these three minutes, the fluid is sucked into the lesion and the enamel body is filled up with the resin. Then you clean off with superfloss everything at the surface, 
That's where we don't want it. We don't want it at the surface. We only want it in the lesion body and we like to it. For Your 20 screen seconds, is not shared. Screen oh, shared. my screen is... Oh, that's bad. That's You should have told yeah. me about Please. 10 minutes ago. Yeah, no. Please reshare. That's, that's not good. I will show you with the slides once more with a little bit of... A uh, little bit faster. Yeah. I thought it was... It continued to share it, but it didn't. Let me go back in here. So you should see, now you should see my slides. Yeah. Good, okay. I will show you the video once more because you obviously also missed the video. I will just do it that way, then you can, we can go over it a bit quicker. Hello. Hello. So now you can see that they infiltrated the, the, the cube, yeah. Now the cube is put into water, the sugar cube, and a control sugar cube is basically placed there. And as you can see, of course, the non infiltrated cube, as we all know it, it's dissolving, whilst the infiltrated one isn't accessible to the solvent, to the water, and it's staying there like nothing happened. And that's quite a plastic, it's, it's quite useful to see what happens, to understand what happens there. And what I was showing to you is that. This is the applicator there. Um, after separating and cleaning the teeth, this was what I showed you before, but my slides weren't showing. You use this kind of applicator, and you can see it now. I can enlarge it a bit. That applicator has a porosity here. It's a U-shaped porosity, and that porosity allows stuff only to leave to the treatable surface to the surface which we wanted to treat. In this case, it was the lower right five, measly. And you can now etch the surface with that green acid there. You can see that the acid we are putting out there is green. Then you dry it. And then at the end, and there, this is where we stopped, you infiltrate for three minutes with the infiltrant. Then after these three minutes with the infiltrant, you light cure it. And this is what you can see here now, hopefully. Now it's back. You can see that this infiltrant is now only going to the two surface we want to infiltrate. And after these three minutes, you remove the applicator, you clean it up with super floss, and you light cure it from three sides, as you can see here. What happens is that is a lowly filled resin, so it shrinks, polymerization shrinkage when you light cure it. And some crevices are developing on the surface. And that's why you repeat this once more for one minute to cover up the surfaces. And then it clinically and radiographically looks exactly the same. And that's important to know. It doesn't change radiographically. It doesn't change clinically. What you could do, and well, I tried to do this. The company DMG is providing you with this. It's, I usually call it the hard pass for the poor. So it's, it's an icon pass where you can put in, okay, when I treated that lesion 10 years ago, it was an early anomaly lesion and in the next follow-up meetings, it didn't change and so on. But what happens because it's not the hard pass, it's only the I can pass, people tend to lose it. Patients are losing it, that's just what happens, but that's something we need to live with. And if we look at the, at the efficacy here, and with that, I wanna go back to my English slides so that you can read what I'm writing there. If you look at the efficacy, if you look at the studies, we know that these systems are massively effective. They are working. We have around 10, 15 randomized controlled trials out there, which I wanted to show you. And we pulled them about five years ago in a, in a systematic review. And we, we looked at the efficacy of the ceiling, but also at the efficacy of the infiltration technology. And what we found here is that at this time, this was, as I said, about four years ago, at this time, about 12, 13 studies were available. And the nice thing is you can see all the studies below each other. You can see the treated lesions. You can see how many lesions progressed. That's what we call events here. You can also see the control, which was fluoride, and how many of these pro progressed. And the nice thing was that the studies nearly uniformly showed both technologies work. They do work. Ceiling works, 
infiltration works. And especially for the infiltration, that's the bottom panel there, all the studies show roughly the same. You prevent around 70 to 80% of the lesion progressions when you infiltrate them instead of only managing them with fluoride. That is massive, that's a huge effect. And that's why by now, these technologies are also recommended by international consensus statements. And I mentioned earlier before that consensus statement of the European and Global Organization of Caries Research, ORCA, and I mentioned the consensus of the European Federation of Conservative Dentistry. And I'm very happy if this would be adopted to India at some point with the Indian dentistry associations. What they say there very clearly is that in high risk individuals or for lesions which are into dentin, you should, it's not you could, you should consider sealing and infiltration. We call it microinvasive strategies because they are always involving some etching for the sealing with the phosphoric acid, for the infiltration with the hydrochloric acid, and you remove some micrometers of enamel. So that's why we call it microinvasive. You should consider them in addition to the non-invasive care to the fluoride. And there was huge agreement. You can see 83% agreement. And overall, the evidence supporting that agreement is moderate, so it's also not too bad. Why is the decision between sealing and infiltration, that's what we stated at that time, is of course guided by a range of issues, like for example, applicability, your experience, the cost of the material and so on. And that, I mentioned that before, I also do sealing. If I can see it, if I can access the lesion, sealing is much faster, easier and cheaper than the infiltration, but for a closed dental arch in a young patient, infiltration is an interesting concept. So what I wanted to do with this lecture, when I come to my conclusions, sorry. I wanted to showcase with one example that these new technologies, especially AI technologies, they can fit very nicely into your practice concept or your clinical concept, but then you need an answer when it comes to therapy as well. Early detection is for carriers, but also for periodontal disease, of course, key and also other oncological diseases. And we know that for many of these conditions, early conditions, dentists have, let's say an imperfect sensitivity. We are not very good at finding early carious lesions. We are not very good at finding early uh, lesions of the periodontal tissues. We are not very good at finding early mucosal lesions. And AI can help us with this. AI can help us with detecting periodontal bone loss. AI can help us with detecting white spot lesions in mucosal photographs. AI can detect, help us in detecting and discriminating white spots of the teeth. So lots of applications fields of AI, but then you need also sufficient and appropriate treatments. It is not ideal to say, well, I have AI of the 21st century, but I'm using the treatment technology of the 19th or 20th century. That's not fitting. And that's why in this example, the infiltration is a huge step forward because what you can now do, you can use an AI system like you can see it here, Dental X-Ray Pro on the iPad. You can show your patients supported by AI, hey, you have an early carious lesion on this tooth. The patient finally understands you and trusts you. He's motivated to go through. And then you say, well, patient, I have another nice thing here in my practice. I can now help you. I can solve that carious problem without drilling. I can treat it without taking a drill with carious infiltration. So it's an end-to-end -end concept, which at least that's the feedback here from the European dentist, which is really, really interesting also for practice marketing and so on. Because of course, if you are doing this in your practice, in your private practice, you stand out in a, in a busy, in a competitive market, like here, for example, in Berlin, practice is always looking for discriminators. And that is something which is helpful for these practices and it's making us better. It allows early effective and evidence-based care. And I think we will see more of these systems in the practice soon. And with that, I'm happy to go into some discussions with you and sorry again for the technical problems and the fact that at some point you didn't see the slides for some minutes. I didn't intend to do that. Can you see me or hear me? Yes, sir. Are there any questions? Uh, if you have any questions, uh, how AI will help in uh, communication and motivation of the patients? 
Well, I tried to, to show you, or I have shown you that, that system we developed, for example. And if you use such a system and you show it to your patient, the patient finally and for the first time understands what you mean. And that is one big step. Second, you are providing not your opinion. Here in Germany, dentists, they don't have the best reputation. German patients always think, oh, the dentist he just wants to make money. He's trying to sell me a service to make money. If you have an AI system, which is like a second independent opinion, you can somehow convince the patient far more that the therapy you suggest is really needed because it's not your opinion and you make me money. It's the opinion of, in this case, the Charité University in Berlin, which you show. That's the second aspect. And in the long run, and that's the third aspect, these systems will allow far more interaction between the patient and his or her data. In some years, the patient will, will receive these reports and these augmented images on their phones. They can interact with them. They can meet, maybe even upload their own images like photos of their teeth to get an opinion upfront before even visiting a dentist. So these systems, they will be driven more by the consumer side at some point than only by the servicing side like it's at the moment. At the moment, most AI applications are used by dentists. I bet in five to 10 years, the majority will be used by patients. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for such wonderful scientific deliberation. It was full of information and an impactful knowledge. Uh, now I would like to uh, say, Dr. Nira Patel, sir, to say some few words of the vote of thanks to the audience. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Vijay. I, Dr. Nira Patel, privileged to propose the vote of thanks on this memorable occasion. On behalf of the Department of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery, Narsibhai Patel Dental College and Hospital, Sakajan Patel University, India, I feel honored to take this opportunity to thank Sri Prakash Patel, sir, President Sakajan Patel University, for providing us excellent infrastructure and opportunity to conduct such unique CD. I would also like to extend my appreciation towards the beloved provost and the Dean Dr. J.R. Patel, sir, for he keen interest, boosting energy for the entire event. I also thanks to our associate dean, Dr. Vilas Patel, ma'am, for constant support. I would like to thanks to all the uh, all head of the department and the staff member of this presence, their presence. I owe special gratitude to our speaker, Prof. Falk, for wonderful scientific deliberation. Thank you very much, sir, for accepting our invitation and delivered a fantastic lecture on artificial intelligence. I would sincerely like to thank, uh, thanks, uh, thank Dental Milestone Guarantee for sponsoring for this event. I would sincerely like to thank our head of the department, Dr. Anil Madagutti, sir, and other staff member, Dr. Shailesh Manar, Dr. Ruchi, Dr. Urvish, and uh, for their wonderful background work. Last but not least, I thank my postgraduate students. Thank you once again. Thank you, sir, and thank you all. Jahin Vande Matram. Hello.